There's a common saying I've heard lots and you have probably heard too. If you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. Maybe not as common as I thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a common saying we've heard from people. We know that we make our best attempt to make plans, but often God has other plans for us. And so sometimes those plans that God has for us are difficult because we have an individual self-will. We have things that we want. <laughs> And we know what we want. And as we grow up in our culture, we're taught to have goals and pursue those goals. We're taught to make vision boards to create them and follow them. We're told to claim it until you get it or fake it until you make it. But as Christians, we're not following our will. We are following God's will. And these disciples with Jesus have been with him for three years, and they're going to be reminded in these upcoming chapters how God's will is very different than their will. We're back in the Gospel of John after a couple of months of breaks, and we are in chapter 18, which begins the arrest of Jesus and the trial of Jesus. You might be familiar from our past times in the Gospel of John. It's an interesting book because the first 12 chapters describe three years of Jesus' life, while the final nine chapters describe only one week of his life. And in particular, chapters 13 through 19 really describe one night and morning period. About a 12-hour period is covered in those seven chapters. And what John is telling us here in these first 11 verses of John 18 is that God has a specific plan for both Jesus and the disciples, which no one can alter without God's permission. John is telling us that God orchestrates his will even when people oppose it. So we're going to be in John chapter 8, starting in verse 1. And continuing to verse 11, we're going to look at Judas's plot here to kill Jesus, Jesus's plan, as well as Peter's attempt to prevent that plan. In the first three verses, we read about Judas's plot, where John writes for us, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. In verse 2, Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So here in verse 1, we see the movement of Jesus. And there's some words that he had spoken. It says at the very beginning of verse 18, when Jesus had spoken these words, or in the NIV it says, when Jesus had finished praying, this closes out what's called the upper room discourse, which is covered in John chapter 13 through 17, where Jesus takes those disciples into that upper room. He has the last supper with them, and he's preparing them for the time when he is going to die and go away. And starting in chapter 18, we're beginning the passion narratives, looking at Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So Jesus speaks these words, and then in verse 18 it says, He went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a valley. Now the Kidron was a valley between Jerusalem and the temple here, and then there's this valley that goes down and then back up, and then there's the Mount of Olives way off to the east. And the ravine of the Kidron is this small little creek that would fill with water when it rained but was often dry during the rest of the year. And the garden that Jesus is going to go to, Mark and Matthew tell us, is the Garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus goes there and was a frequent place that Jesus went with his disciples to rest and to pray. 
So John tells us about the words that Jesus had spoken, the place they go, and the people that are with him. It says Jesus entered the garden. He entered with his disciples. Now, there were only 11 of the 12 disciples with Jesus because in John 13, at the beginning of that upper room discourse, Jesus tells the disciples, one of you is going to betray me, and that's when Judas leaves the room to go betray Jesus. So that's the Messiah's movement in verse 1. Then we see the betrayer Judas's movement in verse 2. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Verse 2 really serves as an explanation of what was going on in verse 1. See, so many people, hundreds of thousands of people would come to Jerusalem for Passover, it would be hard to find Jesus among the crowd. But the Jewish leaders and the Romans, they have a helper. They've got a guy named Judas that knew Jesus' movements, he knew Jesus' habits, and Judas knew where they could find Jesus in the middle of the night. So Judas takes them there. But Judas isn't the only betrayer. There are other people involved, as John tells us in verse 3. Judas, then having received the Roman cohort and the officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. See, planning and executing Jesus had to be a very careful thing if the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus. In the Gospel of John, we'd read about how Jesus was out in the small rural areas and he had little small followings here and there. And they had tried to arrest Jesus to kill him then, but each time Jesus escaped, saying that his time wasn't ready. But now Jesus is in the big city of Jerusalem at Passover where hundreds of thousands of people are there. They want to kill Jesus, but they have to be very careful because if they kill him and cause a riot and disturbances, the Jewish leaders will lose their permission to practice Judaism in the temple. They're only allowed to practice their religious laws in Jerusalem at the temple under the authority of the Romans. And the Romans want peace. If the Jews start causing issues and riots, the Romans are going to take away the Jews' permission to operate at the temple. So they have to very carefully choose how they're going to arrest Jesus, how they're going to put him on trial and kill him. And this is part of the beginning of that careful way that they go about doing that. And John tells us about the three groups of people that go to arrest Jesus. He says there was a Roman cohort, or the NIV says a detachment of soldiers, which likely was about 600 soldiers that go to arrest Jesus. Then there's a second group. There are the officers from the chief priests. These likely were the temple police at the Jewish, Jewish temple in Jerusalem kind of the private police force for the temple. And then there were those Pharisees, the strict adherence people to the law. And they come in this way. It says they come with lanterns and torches and weapons. They came ready for resistance at nighttime. This group of 600 plus soldiers come ready to pick up what all they know is just an insurrectionist that claims to be a king is probably all they know. They don't know what to expect. So that's Judas's plot, his plan to kill Jesus, his plan really to partner with the religious leaders to kill Jesus. Next, John tells us about Jesus's plan in verses 4 through 9. These five verses aren't contained in any of the other three Gospels. They're unique to the Gospel of John. And we see here that Jesus, he admits he's the one that the Romans are looking for. Starting in verse 4, it says, So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. 
He said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now imagine this scene in your mind. It's the middle of the night. It's completely dark. Jesus is alone in the garden. There are 600 soldiers coming to surround him in a group. Jesus is in the dark in a dark garden with olive trees around him. The Romans come with lighted lanterns so they can see the way. Jesus is submissive and he's going to give himself up to them. They come in force to take him. Jesus is unarmed. And the text says they come with weapons. And Jesus starts this encounter with a question in verse 4. He says, whom do you seek? See, Jesus wasn't surprised by anything. Jesus was omniscient. He knew everything. In the past, Jesus had hid himself from the Romans every time the Pharisees sent people to arrest him, but now he's willing to give himself up. A.T. Robertson in his book, Word Pictures in the New Testament says, Jesus was not taken by surprise. The surrender and death of Jesus were voluntary acts, though the guilt of Judas and the rest remains. And Jesus answers these Roman soldiers in verse 5 he says I am he which could be a reference to his deity that I am going all the way back to the book of Exodus was when Moses meets God in that burning bush and God says I am who I am or it could just be a simple way that Jesus references himself So Jesus questions them, he gives them an answer, and then a response in verse 6. So Jesus said to them, I am he, a second time. They drew back and fell to the ground. Now in the Old Testament, there are times where people were able to see a glimpse of God and they often fell back or fell to the ground before God. This could be a reference to that. It could just be a simple idea here when these soldiers fall back that they take a step back and there's so many of them they just knock the rest over like dominoes maybe is a simple way to describe them falling back they could be stepping back and falling back ready for a counter assault kind of like a fighting position but most likely they fall back in response that this guy alone in the garden is claiming to be God in front of them And what we see from Jesus in this situation is these 600 Roman soldiers show up to him that he knows God has complete control of the situation he finds himself in. He's unarmed, in the dark, while these 600 soldiers show up with weapons and lanterns ready to take him. And Jesus knows why they've come. Jesus knows that God has complete control over his situation. And that's a great reminder for us that regardless of what situation we might be in life, God always is in control. No matter what kind of battles or difficulties are in face of us, no matter how much we might be in fear, God is still in control of our situation. We might not see where he's leading or why he is leading us, but we can know that he is in control of our situation. So Jesus admits to these Roman soldiers that he's the one in verses 4 through 6. And then he describes for us, and we read in verses 7 through 9, how he accepts that he's the sacrifice for us. Verse 7 starts, Therefore he again asks them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these go their way. To fulfill the word which he spoke, of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. 
See, as Jesus continues this interaction with the soldiers, the purpose there that he has is he wants to show these soldiers that they are there to get him and no one else. He asks them, who are you looking for? Jesus the Nazarene. I am them. I am him. And he repeats that over and over and over again because he wants to make these soldiers realize they have authority to take him, but not to hurt any of the 11 disciples that are there. And again, Jesus references his deity when he says, I am he, there in verse 8. It's the third time he gives that reference that he is God. And John, in his gospel, sprinkles that phrase, I am, seven times throughout the gospel as a way to show us that Jesus is God. So we see the deity of God, but also the duty, duty of God there in verse 8. Jesus tells the Roman soldiers, I told you I am he, so if you seek me, let these go their own way. Referring to those 11 disciples that are with him. The NLT, New Living Translation, puts it a little easier to, to understand. It says, since I am the one you want, let these others go. Even at this difficult time, as Jesus is about to be arrested, he's thinking not about himself, but those 11 disciples that are with him. He's thinking about their protection and their care, even as he is about to be started and beginning that trial and arrest and death on a cross. He's being rejected by Israel and arrested by Rome but he's focusing on those disciples and caring for them. And imagine being a disciple in that environment. It's dark. You can maybe see a couple of these Roman soldiers as they approach Jesus, but you can definitely feel them and hear them as they are not just coming up to Jesus to talk to him face to face, but likely they are surrounding this entire garden to make sure Jesus doesn't slip away like he has all these other times. The disciples are probably scared, would be a mild way to put it. But John here quotes something that Jesus had said earlier in the gospel, back in chapter 6. In John 18, verse 9, he quotes that, those words from Jesus. John says, To fulfill the word which Jesus spoke, of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. Referring to Jesus saying, whoever the Father gives to him, whoever the Father saves, Jesus won't lose anyone. So while we see and learn from Jesus that God has complete control of the situation in our life, God has complete control also of our salvation. As Jesus is describing here, directed to these 11 disciples first and all of the disciples that will come to follow Jesus afterwards. John MacArthur writes, he says, Jesus knew that being arrested and perhaps imprisoned or executed was more than the disciples could bear and it could shatter their faith. So he made sure it did not happen. All believers are weak and vulnerable, if not protected by the Lord. But he will never let them be tempted beyond what they can bear, as evidenced here. Believers are eternally secure, not in their own strength, but by the gracious and constant protection of our Savior. See, Jesus is fulfilling the Father's will in John chapter 6, that nobody the Father gives to Jesus will be lost. He's also referencing from John chapter 10 about how the good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep, and no wolf or any thief can come into the sheepfold and steal those sheep from Jesus. This is also a future picture of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus, how he will serve as the substitute for us, that we will not die in our sins, but he will die in place of us and take our place. Jesus is dying for these disciples and instead of them. 
In Romans, Paul writes for eight chapters about our faith that's placed in Jesus and salvation and how we're saved by faith. And then he wraps up those first eight chapters in this way. In Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 35, he says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Author and pastor Max Lucado in his book, In the Grip of Grace, which is based on the book of Romans, says the same one who saved us is there to save us still. There is never a point in time that you are any less saved than you were at the first moment that God saved you. Just because you were grumpy at breakfast doesn't mean you're condemned at breakfast. When you lost your temper yesterday, you didn't lose your salvation. Your name doesn't disappear and reappear in the book of life according to your moods or actions. See, God has complete control of our situations and he has complete control of our salvation. So we've seen Jesus' plot here and how to kill Jesus. We've seen Jesus' plan to die for these disciples on their behalf. And lastly, in the final two verses, we read about Peter's prevention that he tries to orchestrate. Verse 10 says, Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Interesting actions from Peter. Jesus has just promised them their safety there in verse 9. But Peter steps in and we see the impulse of Peter. He doesn't hesitate. He's ready to battle in defense of Jesus. It is 1 versus 600. But Peter doesn't hesitate. In the past, Peter had expressed his devotion to Jesus verbally, but now he expresses it physically. And you have to admire Peter's courage. Maybe a little early, maybe a little misguided, but we can appreciate and admire Peter's courage to be willing to take out a short little dagger. There's two words for, for swords in Greek. One is a big long sword, and that's not the one used here. The one used here is like a short little dagger. So he's got this short little dagger, and he is ready to take on 600 rough, tough, rugged Roman soldiers in the dark to defend Jesus. But Peter, he failed to realize that this was Jesus' plan. Jesus had told them throughout the three years, I'm going to another place to prepare for you. I'm going to be departing from you. That was part of the purpose of that upper room discourse, to prepare the disciples for when Jesus was going to die. Somehow Peter seems to not understand that Jesus' plan is to die. And this is the beginning of that plan. So Jesus rebukes Peter in verse 11. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? See, Peter is stepping between Jesus and God's will. So Jesus is asking Peter to step aside. And when Jesus references this cup, this is a metaphor for Christ's death. In the Old Testament, talking about a cup often referred to suffering or physical punishment. And this cup is what Jesus uses to describe his own future suffering and death. Death. When James and John approach Jesus and they say, 
we have a question for you. We want to be at the right hand of you in heaven. Part of Jesus' response to them is Jesus says, Are you ready to drink the cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? That's how he responds to them in Mark and Matthew. And in other Gospels, in Luke, they talk about Jesus in this same garden holding up the cup of suffering and asking the Father, Is this your will? Do you really need me to die? But Jesus expresses this in an emphatic way, saying, Shall I not drink it? It's an affirmative answer. And what we see here from Peter's prevention that he tries to attempt to stop Jesus from being arrested is that we need to have a plan to follow God's plan, even when it doesn't match our plan. One commentary I read this week put it in a in a good way. He said, Jesus was able to accept the cup because it was mixed by the Father and given to him from the Father's hand. He did not resist the Father's will because he came to do the Father's will and finish the work which he gave him to do. Since the Father had mixed and measured the contents of the cup, Jesus knew he had nothing to fear. This is a good lesson for us. We need uh, never fear the cups that the Father hands to us. To begin with, our Savior has already drunk the cup before us, and we are only following in His footsteps. We need never fear what is in the cup because the Father has prepared it for us in love. If we ask for bread, He will never give us a stone, and the cup He prepares will never contain anything that will harm us. We may suffer pain and heartbreak, but he will eventually transform that suffering into glory, says Warren Wearsby in his commentary on John. See, Jesus knew the Father's plan for his life, and he was following that plan. He had listened to the Father's words to him and what God the Father had told him he had been sent to the earth to do for people. But Peter thought he could prevent that plan. He was preventing God's will. Sometimes those plans that God puts in front of us are hard. Sometimes those plans that he puts in front of us really hurt. And sometimes when we start to go contrary to God's plans, he has to insert himself and tells us to stop, just as Peter gets told to stop by Jesus. So as we wrap up our time together, These words and actions of Jesus remind us that he cares for you and he cares for me. That's why he died for you and me. That's why he healed the servant's ear. I forgot to mention that when we read about it. Luke, the doctor, who is obviously sensitive to the physical body, he mentions that Jesus heals the high priest's slave's ear, Malchus's ear. So Jesus, he died for you and me. Jesus, he healed that slave's ear. And that's why he protected the disciples from the harm that could have come on them in the garden. Because Jesus died and took our place for us. And if that's something you've not accepted, if you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ, I pray and beg that you would do that today that you'd place your faith in him because he did die for you and he died for me. And he wants us to be in heaven with him if we will accept that free offer. But while he does care for you and me, sometimes that road is difficult. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. Sometimes it's a rough road. Sometimes it's an uphill road. Sometimes he doesn't give us what we want. If you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. I was talking with someone recently and as asking them about his thoughts of God and Jesus. And the person said, well, I was in this situation and God did what I needed here. And I was in this situation and God met my need here. And I was in this situation and I wanted this and God gave that to me. And after the conversation, I left and The impression I got was this person believes God exists because every time they wanted something, God gave it to them. 
Now, I'm glad that they believe God exists, but I'm not sure how long that process will continue because God is God. He doesn't meet our wants and needs. He has a plan. And he has a specific plan that we see here for Jesus and the disciples, and no one could alter that plan because God orchestrates his plan even if we oppose it. Let's pray. God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, that died for us on the cross. He took our place. As we sang about and talked about in our music worship, the most amazing gift, the most amazing love that we could ever understand was shown to us and how you sent your son, Jesus, to die for us. And we pray for those that are lost, that don't know you, that have not placed their faith in you. We pray for your Holy Spirit that will convict those people of sin in their lives and that will baptize them and save them and indwell them. We pray for anyone that might be here that wants to place their faith in you, God, or listening at a later time. We pray that your spirit would indwell them and save them and seal them and place them in your kingdom. In these things we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. So I'll invite you, if you're able, to stand for the benediction. Let us go and be a light to our community. Just as we have placed our faith in Jesus, our light, let us go and be a light to others so that we may point them to the source of our true light, Jesus Christ. Amen.